Well, hello and welcome to the 8th lecture regarding mitochondrium and ATP synthesis. This lecture was given by Professor Janusz Solusi. Well, this lecture is mainly about the ATP synthase complex and chemiosmotic uh, theory and then at the very end of the lecture there is a list of reasons that why my, we think that mitochondrion has got endosymbiotic uh, origins and if you don't know what endosymbiotic origins means it is uh, you may want to read the first lecture which is introduction the last part of it there is a, a very short explanation about endosymbiosis it's very easy you can understand it yourself so now let's get to the lecture one of the important slides, very important slides of this lecture is this slide. They even often ask questions on this picture, like they point out to this structure and they ask what is it. So it is good to know the name of the structures by this picture. Now this is a mitochondrion, and mitochondrion as you probably know has got two membranes. An inner membrane, this pinkish structure, and an outer membrane. And between the inner and outer membrane is called intermembrane space. And on the inner membrane of the mitochondria, on the inner membrane of the mitochondria, we've got these uh, very dark pink structures, ATP synthase complexes, or ATP synthase particles, these uh, dark pink structures. And you can see there are foldings, there are invaginations and foldings on the inner membrane of mitochondria. These foldings provide a higher surface area for mitochondria and these foldings are called cristae. And when, then we have got the ribosomes of mitochondria which are to a certain extent unique. These ribosomes are mainly different from the ribosomes that we can find in the cytoplasm of the cells. They are unique to mitochondria. And well, then we've got granules, again specific to mitochondria. And well, the famous uh, mitochondrial DNA, which is a, you, you really can't see here because it's wound around itself, but mitochondrial DNA, as you know, is a circular DNA. And so, well, this picture is important try to memorize everything here except well the the numbers of the like diameters but it's it's good to know that the diameter of a mitochondria is about microns so micrometers like but you don't need to know like uh, which one is the length and the width just about microns are the diameters of the mitochondria now that you know basics about mitochondria, let me introduce you to the chemiosmotic theory. Well, chemiosmotic theory was introduced first by Peter Mitchell, so it's also called Peter Mitchell's theory. And what it says, this theory explains the ATP synthesis during the electron uh, transport through the respiratory chain in mitochondria. So if you remember from medical chemistry, after glycolysis, uh, the pyruvates which are formed, then if oxygen is provided, they will undergo TCA cycle to form, to generate NADH molecules. With these NADH molecules, then will uh, will go to the inner membrane of the uh, 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 of the mitochondria and will release their electron uh, in this inner membrane via a pathway, a specific type of pathway you don't need to know exactly, and this electron will be transported through a chain of proteins on the inner membrane of mitochondria and the first thing that's going to happen is that the first four protein complexes, complex 1, complex 2, 3, and complex 4, they will uh, 
utilize the energy provided by these electrons as you can see here this dark green structure here represents all these complexes so it's an over simplified picture this uh, dark green structure is complex 1 2 3 and 4 and the electron is getting passed along these complexes providing the energy for these complexes to grab uh, hydrogens from uh, inside the mitochondria from the matrix of the mitochondria to the space which is between the outer and inner membrane of mitochondria the inner membrane space of mitochondria and by doing so by doing so a great concentration gradient of protons of hydrogen ions will be generated in the intermembrane space of, my, uh, of mitochondria and then when this great concentration is maintained we have got complex 5 or ATP synthase complex this light green structure here which will be activated how when uh, the, uh, the, uh, the way it will be activated is that it will allow the passage of all these protons of all these hydrogen ions down their concentration gradient to the matrix of mitochondria and while these protons are passing through this complex 5 or ATP synthase this protein will harvest the energy of this chemical gradient to produce ATP from ADP and that is basically what chemiosmotic theory is about so it kind of explains where we get the energy of our body from so like if our body is like a uh, uh, like a city and mitochondria is like the power plant of this city this theory explains what exactly happens in this power plant and one thing uh, that, uh, uh, that I, I need to mention is that here we've got something called the respiratory chain as I mentioned are the, the, the chain of all these proteins the first four uh, take protons in the intermembrane space the fifth one or ATP synthase uh, allows the passage of protons you may recall these protons these chains uh, this chain from high school or for for some of you maybe you've heard uh, the phrase uh, electron transport chain so electron transport chain is the same uh, as the this respiratory chain because you see electron is getting passed along all these complexes and then oxygen will be the last electron don uh, uh, electron donor because this electron can't just vanish it, it needs to be transported to something at the very in, end and that thing is oxygen and when electron is transported to oxygen then with with the help of all the hydrogen concentration uh, the hydrogen concentration in the matrix that oxygen uh, will form the water so in the process of ATP uh, synthesis we're gonna have water production and it, I, I always encourage you to understand the gradients the concentration or electrochemical gradient of ions in this lecture it's about the protons in other lectures it may be about sodium and potassium these gradients are important and they often ask about it now one other thing that I need to mention now about the inner membrane of mitochondria is that on the inner membrane of mitochondria we've got a very specific very special uh, type of uh, lipids they're called uh, they're called cardiolipins now cardiolipins 
they ensure that this hydrogen concentration, which is maintained in the intermembrane space, will remain in the intermembrane space. So they will prevent the leaking of hydrogen ions from the intermembrane space to the matrix. So cardiolipins uh, ensure that the, the inner membrane is not permeable to hydrogen ions. Now, one other thing to mention about this, uh, generally about this uh, ATP synthase complex that is that this ATP synthase complex can be altered in a special type of cells in a way that when hydrogen ions are passing through this complex instead of production of ATP this complex will only produce heat so the cells which have this type of altered uh, uh, ATP synthase complex which by the way is called thermogen thermogenin or uncoupling uh, uh, protein or UCP which is the altered version of ATP synthase complex the cells containing this type of protein will not produce energy they will add uh, by energy I mean ATP because as we said mitochondria being the power plant of the cells produces energy and the mainstream energy for our body is ATP but UCP or thermogenin doesn't produce energy the only thing that it produces is heat so when is it when when uh, what type of cells need uh, these kind of proteins and what type of animals do need these type of uh, proteins now in humans we can see a high ratio of cells containing these type of proteins just in infants but as we grow up the ratio of uh, the cells containing UCP proteins will lower to a very great extent but these type of proteins can be uh, observed in animals like uh, polar bears in general uh, in cold adapted animals and just to know uh, these specific type of cells that I'm talking about that you can see thermogenic complex on, uh, on are called brown adipocytes because we have two main type of adipocytes and you're gonna uh, read about adipocytes in details in histology so you don't need to know about adipocytes just in order to understand UCP complex Now we get to the hard part of this lecture. The part which we have to talk in detail in molecular level about ATP synthase complex. But if we break it down to simpler parts, it's going to be very understandable because it's it's very rational. It's very logical. So First things first is that the, 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 it's a big complex. ATP uh, synthase complex is a big complex. And mainly it contains of two parts. An F0 part and an F1 part. The F0 part has got B and C and A subunits. And the F1 part has got alpha, beta, gamma, lambda, uh, uh, gamma, epsilon, and delta subunits. But the subunits which are important and you have to know about are the alpha and beta subunits and gamma and epsilon subunits. These subunits, which I just mentioned, alpha, beta, gamma, and epsilon, you need to memorize. And so, as you probably noticed, the F0 subunit, the, the F0 portion, the F0 portion is a transmembrane portion, is the transmembrane portion of ATP synthase. And F1 is the cytosolic portion. So the head of this complex is 
in the membrane and the main body of the complex is in the cytoplasm of the cell. Here is a simpler depiction that uh, you will be able to understand better. And the way this whole complex works, and bear in mind that at the very end we want the production of ATP. So what, whatever we're saying right now, at the end we want to reach that how ADP will be phosphorylated to become ATP. The first thing is that this high concentration of hydrogen ions provided by complexes 1, 2, 3 and 4 in the intermembrane of mitochondria will start flowing from the uh, intermembrane, which is this portion, to the cytoplasm via the F0 portion. You can see this is the membrane, so this part is the F0 portion. And hydrogen ions will start flowing back to the cytoplasm via the A subunit of the F0 portion of ATP synthase complex. And while this flow is happening, the complex works exactly like a windmill or a water mill. So this flow will cause the rotation of the C subunit of the F0 portion. And when the C subunit rotates, the subunits attached to it will rotate with it. So the gamma subunit and epsilon subunit that you can see here will start rotating with C subunit. And the rotation of gamma subunit, the rotation of gamma subunit will cause conformational changes within alpha beta subunits. So do not mistake alpha beta subunits do not rotate themselves. And why is that? Because as we said, the alpha subunit, uh, the alpha subunit of F0 portion is the, uh, is the subunit which is stationary, it doesn't rotate. And the C subunit is the one which rotates. And the alpha subunit is attached to alpha beta subunits via these B and delta subunits. So A subunit will, ma uh, will make sure that alpha beta subunits indirectly, of course, will make sure that alpha beta subunits will not rotate and they will remain stationary. Where, uh, while this gamma subunit uh, is rotating inside these alpha beta subunits and causing conformational changes within them, and among these beta and alpha subunits, only beta subunits uh, uh, have the uh, catalytic power to produce ATP. Uh, in order to understand better, here's a cross section of alpha beta subunits and you can see the gamma subunit is within them you really don't need to understand these uh, uh, these uh, reactions in detail because it, even professors themselves uh, usually say that we don't know everything about them so it's a very complicated uh, uh, subject what you need to know as you can see here the gamma subunit is not like a cylinder, a complete cylinder. The, the, its shape is quite unique. And when it rotates, it you know causes the conformational changes within these other subunits. And that is how the uh, catalytic, the enzymatic uh, properties of especially beta subunits, which are shown here, are functioning in order to produce ATP from ADP. So now that we're done with the ATP synthase complex and in general with the respiratory chain uh, uh, in the inner membrane of mitochondria, let's talk about protein import or uh, in general the import and export of proteins to the uh, mitochondria. So for this purpose there are uh, special, specific types of uh, proteins, uh, protein translocators uh, located on the inner and outer membrane of uh, mitochondria. 
before we start talking about protein import, let's talk about a, another special property of the outer membrane of uh, mitochondria this time. The outer membrane of mitochondria contains very small pores known as porins. These porins will allow the passage of small size molecules and ions. And if you think about it, this will cause the same concentration of important ions and small molecules between the intermembrane and the cytoplasm of the cell. So, the concentration of most ions and small molecules between the intermembrane of mitochondria and cytoplasm is the same because of these porins. But the concentration of ions, for example, like hydrogen ion, which is very important and we talked about it and we, talk, we said why, is different between cytoplasm and uh, the matrix of mitochondria because inner membrane of mitochondria doesn't uh, contain such porins. And now that we've talked about porins, let's get back to protein transport. The proteins, first of all, not all proteins can just enter the mitochondria. Proteins which are required to get in the mitochondria, they have a special, uh, they, they have a specific uh, peptide sequence at their end, a signal sequence, which will send signals and during pathways will cause translocation of these proteins into the mitochondria. So not all type of proteins can go in the mitochondria and they often like to ask about it in the relation analysis questions. You know, they want to play with words. So bear in mind, in order for a protein to go in the mitochondria, they need to have specific signal sequences. And the other important thing about the protein translocation to mitochondria is that proteins are imported to the matrix of mitochondria in denatured and unfolded uh, state. This is very important. They usually ask about it and they usually compare the protein transport to mitochondria with protein transport to, uh, to the nucleus, which we're going to talk about later. And I, I really haven't seen them trying to ask questions about the protein tra transloca uh, translocators themselves, like uh, or the uh, these uh, protein complexes which allow the passage of proteins, like TIM and TOM complexes. So I really think these uh, concepts are absurd, and you don't need to know them. But what you need to know is that because these proteins are transported in an unfolded, denatured form, they are prone to interactions which can be devast uh, devastating for them. And that is why they need to be, uh, they need to be protected against these uh, interactions. Um, and one way to make sure that these unfolded proteins will not interact with the other materials which they don't need to interact with are heat shock proteins or HSPs. The, the other name for HSPs are chaperones. You're going to also read about them in uh, uh, molecular biology too. So, a common type of these HSPs, which also exist in the cytoplasm, is HSP70. Now, you can see this HSP70 here, these HSP70s, that are bound to, let's say, this is the polypeptide chain, this is the protein, and this here is the matrix of mitochondria. So, 
the uh, these HSP proteins uh, are here too bound to the uh, the protein which we want to transport to the mitochondria the protein gets into the mitochondria again we've got HSP 70 proteins HSP 70 chaperones binding to it but at the very end stage of protein trans, uh, transport to mitochondria we need another specific type of HSP proteins HSP 60 chaperonins in order to get these transported proteins fully functional in the mitochondria and these HSP 60s in the cell they are specific to mitochondria you cannot find them in other parts of the cell and by saying that we can start concluding uh, that why we assume mitochondria uh, that uh, we assume mitochondria have endosymbiotic uh, origins that why we think at the very beginning these mitochondria they were just some bacteria floating in the water that the first eukaryotic cells invaginated engulfed these uh, bacteria into them and instead of digesting them they started living off each other which is called endosymbiosis in a very oversimplified version in order to know the more accurate version uh, study the uh, minimals for the first uh, lecture and so we can see that there are these HSP 60s in the mitochondria which are not present anywhere else in eukaryotic cells but there are a lot of them in other prokaryotic cells so this is one reason that we can say yes mitochondria are very like uh, prokaryotes they may have prokaryotic origins uh, bacter uh, bacteriotic origins another reason is the ribosomes in the uh, mitochondria as I said before ribosomes in the mitochondria are are different from the ribosomes normal ribosomes on the cytoplasm or on the ER uh, the most observable difference under electron microscopy is their size they are very smaller than normal eukaryotic ribosomes now another reason is their circular DNA because eukaryotic DNAs are not circular only prokaryotic like bacterial DNAs are circular and mitochondria have circular DNA and regarding the uh, mitochondrial DNA you need to know the following that they are circular that they do not form chromosomal structures that they do not have histones that mitochondrial DNA is inherited fully from the mother so if you take one person all the mitochondrial genes all the mitochondrial DNAs in that person is inherited from his mother the other reason that we can conclude that mitochondrias a mitochondria have endosymbiotic origins is that they have two membranes the inner membrane is the membrane of a which resembles prokaryotic membranes which resembles uh, bacterial uh, membranes the outer membrane resembles the membrane of eukaryotic cells so we can say when these eukaryotic cells were engulfing the uh, mitochondria via endocytosis they engulfed it with a layer of their own uh, membrane around the mitochondria and that is how mitochondria has got two membranes and also we can see alterations from standard genetic code in the mitochondrial the DNA and what we mean by that is like for example imagine that in normal DNA 
uh, DNAs, a, a base sequence has got a specific meaning. Like if there is C, C, T, T, A, A, T, T, this has got a specific meaning and it's universal. Like it doesn't matter if in human cells, in like uh, uh, cow cells, you know, this is the alphabet of life, the base sequences, the codes of DNA. But in case of mitochondria, these codes may have different meanings. They are altered. And the reason is this endo, uh, this uh, engulfment of mitochondria by eukaryotic cells happened millions, billions actually, years ago before the genetic code becomes universal. So this can be another reason that we say mitochondria have got uh, and the symbiotic origins. One other thing that you need to know about the ribosomes of mitochondria is that uh, they produce very few uh, proteins, about 13 proteins. And the reason is that mitochondrial DNA codes for very few proteins, 13 proteins, because a lot of proteins needed for the mitochondria is imported. Only very vital or special proteins are coded by the DNA of mitochondria itself and produced by the ribosomes of mitochondria. And that was about this lecture. So, see you in the next one.